Okay, I want to take a step back and look at, at what happened in artificial intelligence from the beginning of the field until basically the mid-1980s. People who were working in artificial intelligence were working on a single entity, a single program, a single computer that was trying to do something intelligent. And people had all sorts of ideas about different domains that they might want to work on. There were robotics uh, researchers, there were planners that were working in, in single agent planning, game playing programs, medical diagnosis programs, natural language understanding, lots and lots of different fields. Yet the perspective of each of the researchers in each of these areas was that there was a single entity that they were concerned about having act intelligently. And the question was, eventually, that arose in the field, why not have multiple entities that would interact with one another in an intelligent way? Why must we look at single agents that operate in the world and not at multiple agents that interact with each other? Now, the situation, even back in the early days of artificial intelligence, wasn't so simple because a single agent has to interact with an environment. And that environment might be predictable, it might be unpredictable, it might be another player, right, in a multiplayer game. So those who designed chess playing programs in the early days of artificial intelligence obviously considered there to be another intelligent agent in the environment that this program was playing with, right? But the model of that environment, the model of the other player was very, very rudimentary. And the assumption in single agent artificial intelligence was that we would use either environment models that somehow included in them players, other agents, for example, a uh, famous uh, movie of uh, the robot Shaky from the early 1970s showed the, uh, the robot moving blocks around and actually planning, and then they had somebody come in, walk in a person, and move the block unexpectedly, and then had the robot deal with the change. So there was this environment which was causing changes dynamically, but Shaky had no model of, of the other intelligent agent that might be in the environment of any other intelligent agent. So the question really arose within the field, could we start to look at questions that involve multiple agents and ask questions that were relevant for sophisticated models that might exist among these different artificial intelligence agents? Um, so really the, the question arose in a natural way, but it took a while for the field to get its feet, uh, get to its feet and figure out what the right models ought to be. Um, the initial research from the early 1980s actually took a very, very specific point of view on what was called at the time distributed artificial intelligence. It said if we're going to design a functionally or geographically distributed system to do something intelligent, let's say a sensor network that's supposed to derive high-level hypotheses about uh, traffic in a, over the countryside, over some landscape, and we're trying to design this system how should we design the different pieces so that they interact with one another such that the whole performs some intelligent task? And that was the push for distributed artificial intelligence in the early 1980s. Gradually, over the years, however, a different question arose, and that was, let's not consider the system to be, have been centrally designed to do something intelligent. Let's consider a whole community of individual actors, individual agents, each one perhaps designed by a different entity, perhaps designed by different companies or different, different companies or, or, or governments, and they're going to interact in some way, and each of them is going to be intelligent, and how should we give them the tools necessary for them to interact successfully with one another? Okay, now that, that became the main question in what came to be called multi-agent systems. Um, Again, the question arises, what should the models of interaction look like? There are a lot of different models of interaction that theoreticians have looked at, uh, both before and after the rise of multi-agent systems within artificial intelligence. Auctions as a model of interaction, negotiation, argumentation, where agents actually not only discuss things with each other and negotiate, but give reasons for why they have certain points of view. Social choice, which is another name for voting theory, coalitions, and the answer at the bottom is yes. Uh, in fact, that is the answer. The answer is that all of these models have been adopted by researchers in multi-agent systems as potential models for intelligent interaction among, among agents. And if you want to look at it in another way of another slice, instead of looking at it as auctions, negotiation, social choice, so and so on, you can also look at it as the classical um, division within game theory of the design of strategies and the designs of mechanisms. So within what's broadly called game theory, there's the design of strategies. Given an interaction, how would a rational agent react? 
and the design of mechanisms, which is how do we design an interaction such that rational agents will act in certain ways. So if you design an auction in such a way that the agents that come to the auction are incentivized to always tell the truth and report true information, you're involved in mechanism design. You're involved in the design of a mechanism where rational agents will come and act in a certain way, efficiently, truthfully. If, on the other hand, you're looking at a situation that's a given and you're trying to design your agents to act rationally in those situations, then you're designing strategies. Another way of looking at this entire big picture is as a high-level protocol analysis and design. So all of you are familiar with low-level protocols, the ways the computers communicate with each other, TCP IP, they pass packets back and forth. There are well-designed protocols for low-level interaction. What the researchers in multi-agent systems came along, along with researchers in other fields, started to ask questions about how would we design high-level protocols that have certain good properties that we would like them to have? How would we design high-level protocols so that agents can interact effectively? So the match between game theory and multi-agent systems is very good, it's very close, and it has a lot, um, a lot to uh, give. Uh, game theory has a lot to give to multi-agent systems in terms of providing a partial roadmap for the kinds of questions and sometimes the kinds of answers that we want to give. Multi-agent systems is interested in self-interested computational entities. Game theory is interested in decision-making environments full of self-interested entities. And here's where we come to the to one of the key issues from today's talk, one of the big takeaways from here. Game theory looks mainly at solution concepts which define uh, certain kinds of outcomes. And I put the word rational here intentionally, but it's arguable about the rationality of, or what it, we mean by rationality. Solution concepts is the right way of looking at what game theory does when it looks at interactions. As those of you who are familiar with something like the Nash equilibrium, where agents are playing strategies that are in equilibrium with each other, and neither one is incentivized to change their strategy as long as the other one is playing the current strategy. And these strategies are in equilibrium with each other, and they're in a nice, stable, solid point together. What can we say about a Nash equilibrium? We can say it's a solution concept. In other words, it is a mathematical property that the interaction has. To a certain extent, uh, extent, it's a static property of the interaction. We're looking at a mathematical entity, which will, can be defined formally, and then we're saying there is a certain property that this interaction has, and I'm not telling you whether people will actually do that. I'm not even telling you whether it's a good thing for them to play the Nash equilibrium, but I can describe the Nash equilibrium as a mathematical property. What happened when the computer scientists started to get involved with these game theoretic questions was they started to look at questions of computation. And computation are central to the notion of what we're trying to do as computer scientists because we're interested in implementing these protocols and we have to be concerned about, for example, the computational complexity of finding Nash equilibrium. It's a very interesting question. What is the computational complexity of finding Nash equilibrium? To the best of my knowledge, decades went by in mathematics without that question being asked. Now both mathematicians and computer scientists ask those kinds of questions. But the dynamics of interaction, the dynamics of how, uh, how would two agents when they come together in an interaction find a Nash equilibrium? How long would it take them to find a Nash equilibrium? What if there are multiple Nash equilibria? Which one would they, they converge to? These were the kinds of questions that were of natural interest to computer scientists who were actually interested in implementing these things in real life systems. So I want to give you actually one example. I'm going to give, actually give you two examples, and they're both side detours from the main uh, material that I want to talk about today. Um, because mainly I want to talk about cooperative game theory today and descend a little bit into the rabbit hole of, of coalitions and how we would look at the interactions between intelligent agents that want to work together in a coalition. But before that, I want to take two little detours. And the first one is about voting. It's about computational social choice. And it's the kinds of questions that are being asked by computer scientists when they look at these kinds of issues. So the classic model of voting and social choice theory, and it's existed for, for over 60 years in economics and mathematics, has been, uh, the classic model has been ordinal preferences that are handed in by the voters. Here we have three voters, and they have a preference over <coughs> four different candidates. 
And each of them has a different preference. So here, the highest ranked candidate is the, the most preferred. And the first voter likes A, and then likes B, and then likes D, and then likes C. So imagine you go into a Knesset vote, and you have all of your 23 parties in front of you, and you're actually forced in the classic model to give a complete ordering over all 23. The best, the worst, there's no distance between them. There's simply a ranked ordering. Maybe you really hate the bottom one, but it doesn't matter. They just come one after the second to last one. The voters hand in these preferences, and then there's supposed to be some method for finding out who won, right? Which of the voters won? In this case, it's kind of confusing, right? Different candidates got first choice, but then there's all this other information that was given over to us about second choices and third choices and so on. So the social choice people, uh, including the, compu the computer scientists who are social choice people, computational social choice, look at as a voting protocol as a function. And it's a function from all that information that was handed in by the voters to some outcome, in our case, either an ordered list or a winning candidate. Um, there are a lot of variations on this. You might be able to hand in uh, strength of preference on the different candidates. It's not always linearly ordered. You might have a partial order. Um, but basically, any function over this information, any function over the input from the voters is a voting rule. Right? So anything could happen. You could, you could choose, there could be a voting protocol that chooses the worst, the one that everybody votes for last. Right? That's going to be the winner. Terrible voting rule, but that's a voting rule. Right? They're all voting rules. Um, along came uh, economists slash mathematicians in the mid-1970s with an important theorem called the gibbard satterthwaite theorem. There's, there are two different people, Gibbard and Satterthwaite, and they were not working together. They each came up with it independently, and now their names are forever linked to one another uh, in this theorem. And what they said was, this is a variation on Arrow's impossibility theorem uh, for social choice. Um, they said that for three or more candidates, one of the following three things has to hold for every voting rule. Either the rule is dictatorial, which means it depends only on a single voter which means all of you are going to vote whatever Tali says, that's going to be the winner. Okay, that's my voting rule. That's a function, right? So that's a perfectly good voting rule. But Tali becomes the dictator and nobody else matters. Or, number two, there's some candidate who cannot win under the rule in any circumstances. I'm just going to make a function that under no set of input will D ever win, right? It'll never happen. Well, that doesn't sound like a very good rule, but it's a degenerate case, we have to say that's not going to be the situation. Or, and this is the important one, number three, the rule is manipulable, which means that there may exist situations where strategic slash untruthful voting may benefit a voter. Which means, taking a step backwards, you're designing the voting system for Israel, <coughs> and you want the Knesset vote to have true input, because true input seems like a good thing to, it, to try to elicit from the voters. The voters will tell the truth about what parties they like, and then there will be some rule that decides how many members of Knesset should be in each party. But it starts out with true input. You know, you don't want garbage in, you'll get garbage out. So you're trying to elicit truth from all of the voters. Gibbert Satterthwaite showed that this was mathematically impossible in the sense you could not design a rule that was where it was guaranteed for every voter all the time to be best for him if he tells the truth. Right? You couldn't design such a rule. We all know of examples of strategic voting that we've run into ourselves where you don't vote for the party, for the Knesset, that you really want to vote. You don't think they're going to have enough votes to get over the threshold, and so you vote for your second favorite party. You might benefit because you vote for your second favorite party. When Gore, Bush, and Nader ran against each other in the 2000 US presidential election, there might have been people who said, you know, I really like Nader, and then Gore, and then Bush, but I'm not going to vote for Nader because I think I might do better if I vote for Gore than if I vote for Nader. I'll vote for Nader, Bush will win. If I vote for Gore, Gore will win. So I'm better off lying. I'm better off being a strategic manipulator. Gibbert Satterthwaite showed this was going to happen with every single voting rule that you ever had, unless the rule was dictatorial. Why? Because if Tali is going to be the dictator, then all of you will vote truthfully because you have no incentive not to vote truthfully, right? Tali's going to be the dictator. He'll vote truthfully because he's going to actually get to decide. He has an incentive to vote truthfully, and all of you have no incentive to lie. So they have to rule that out as one of the, one of the possibilities. This was actually a, uh, a deterministic version, uh, but there's a probabilistic version as well, where you could imagine a probabilistic dictator. You know, everybody vote. I will choose a dictator after the vote probabilistically. 
And then you are all incentivized to tell the truth, because either you will be chosen as the dictator or you won't. If you are chosen as a dictator, you better have, have voted truthfully. If you're not vote chosen as a dictator, it doesn't matter. Right? So a probabilistic dictator would also be uh, an incentive compatible mechanism that would encourage everybody to tell the truth. But Gibbard Satterthwaite said more generally, you're never going to be able to find a rule like this. Well, that's bad news, right? So we have one of these bad news, good news, bad news situations. You know, we, I used to have a children's book like that. Unfortunately, fortunately, unfortunately, fortunately. So unfortunately, there's no rule that would encourage everybody to tell the truth. Fortunately, along came some other researchers and said, you know what? Sometimes these rules, these manipulations, these strat strategic voting is NP hard to find out. Well, that was all of a sudden a computational question, right? That was the kind of question a computer scientist would ask. So the question of NP hardness and manipulation became a good thing in the same way that NP hardness can be a good thing in cryptography. Sometimes complexity is a bad thing. We're, we're unhappy when things are too complex. Sometimes we're happy when they're too complex. So with cryptography or with this case, you'd say, sure, there may exist a manipulation, but it will be exponentially hard for you to find it, and therefore no voter would actually do that because they'll never be able to figure out, or it'll take a very long time for them to figure out how long, uh, how to vote strategically in a beneficial way. But then, of course, the unfortunately comes back in, which is given a reasonable distribution, how hard is it to manipulate? That's only a worst case, right? It's a weak guarantee of resistance to manipulation because that's only a worst case guarantee. So computer scientists, including people from my group, came together and said, let's try to characterize the um, degree of manipulation that a certain rule might have under certain circumstances. So I want to give you just one example, and that's, this is all, again, just a side, an interesting, I think, uh, sidelight on the kinds of questions that are asked by people who are working theoretic, theoreticians in the field of multi-agent systems. So the board account, all of you are probably familiar with this. Uh, each voter submits preferences. Each alternative receives points depending on where it is in the ranking. So the last place candidate receives no points, and the top place candidate receives m minus one points if they're m candidates. And then all you sum up all the points and you use all the information from all of the different uh, voters. So if we had these voters like we had before voting the way that they felt about a b d c c a b d and so on, you give three points to the top candidate in each in each case, two points to the second place, one point to the third place, zero points to the last, and then you sum up the points and you discover that B is the board a winner. Okay, it only got one vote for first place, but it's pretty high, and in fact it's the highest on average, which is the characteristic of, of the board a winner, from the other voters. So they handed in all the information that they had, and B ends up being the winner based on this particular function. Um, it turns out that manipulation in this case, you know, strategic voting may be possible, Manipulation in the single voter border case is trivial. Um, all you need to do, and remember this the next time you're in a border vote in a committee, all you need to do is decide who you want to win, put them first, of course, you want to give them the maximum number of points, and now what you're trying to do is waste the rest of your points in the least harmful manner. You know, you would be very happy if you could just give all your points, most of your points, three points to the top one, and give zero to everybody else and hurt them. But you can't. You have to list them. So what you're trying to do is give it to them in the least uh, harmful manner. And what you do is you look at the weakest candidate and you put him second. And you put the second weakest candidate third, and the third weakest candidate fourth, and so on. And you just rank them in inverse order from their strength. Right? And that way, you'll be wasting your points in as good a way as you possibly can. And if there is a manipulation, then you will find it with a simple polynomial, greedy algorithm, and uh, it's trivial, trivial to find it. So Borda is really highly manipulable in the single voter case. But what about if you have a more complex scenario? For example, weighted coalitional manipulation. Here we have a group of manipulators, right? There's, there's 100 voters, and then five voters come together and say, we're going to be a manipulative coalition. The five of us are going to vote in a way that puts our candidate number one. And what they have to do now is not just vote in a smart way like this single voter case, right? But they have to make sure that they're in sync with one another, that one doesn't destroy the work that the other one wants to do, right? This makes it NP hard in the worst case. 
But what about generally? So generally, the situation was interesting, but it was interesting from a computer science perspective. It was interesting in the sense of how can we characterize error in these cases? And all we ended up looking at was to look at the greedy algorithm expanded to the coalitional case. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this coalition of, of cheaters, of strategic voters, and have them use the greedy algorithm one after another. And you know what? It works a lot of the time. Okay, in the first case, you have these two existing candidates. By the way, I should have mentioned in uh, much of the literature, it's assumed that everyone else has voted already before the manipulators come to the game. And that not only that, but they know everything about the rest of the voters. So it's a really extreme case. You would think that manipulation would be easier if they knew everything about all the other voters already and everything else was, was static. So it's taken as an extreme case in order to make it easier for them to manipulate and still NP hard. But we see that a polynomial time algorithm can actually sometimes work. Here we have three manipulators with weight half, half, and one. They come together. They have these two existing candidates. And their candidate P, who's the candidate they want to win, it so far has no votes whatsoever. So the first voter dumps his main vote here and then tries to get rid of his second vote uh, as, as unharmfully as possible. This next voter does exactly the same thing. And then the final voter comes and plays the same polynomial game and pushes their desired candidate all the way to the top and makes it win. Okay? The next example, unfortunately, is an example where it doesn't work. They use exactly the same polynomial time algorithm. And unfortunately, their preferred candidate did not win the election. This other candidate won the election. But it turns out that had they voted differently, had they not used the greedy algorithm, then they could have had P win. They couldn't use the greedy algorithm and have P win, but, using, but if they used a different algorithm, right, they would, have, they would have gotten what they wanted to do. The question is, how often does this occur? And I'm not going to show you these other two examples. Well, this is the one of, of where they could have gotten their preferred candidate to win, but not with the greedy algorithm. This is another example, which I'm going to go through very quickly because I don't want to show it to you and waste more time. Uh, it does have animation, but still. It turns out that if you have the coalitional weighted manipulation problem with weights W for the manipulator, if there's no manipulation, the greedy algorithm returns false. And if there is a manipulation, and it makes a mistake, it's one voter away from, um, a from a positive manipulation. In other words, the window of error for the greedy algorithm is quite small. This was the first characterization of that window of error. And the bottom line is that intuitively, relatively, the greedy alg algorithm, which is polynomial time, will work in the coalitional weighted manipulation problem almost all the time. Okay, if you have 100 voters, you might get a mistake, but if you added 101 voters, it would work. Okay, so that little error, that little margin of error is going to be quite small. I'll skip past this. I want to give you one other example. Okay, another model of interaction that most of you are probably familiar with. It's not the voting model where you have agents voting over candidates. It's what's called non-cooperative games and game theory. So you're probably all familiar with this. You have a set of agents or players, and you have a set of actions, and you have a utility function that maps the cross product of the actions of the different uh, agents into some utility function for each agent. And of course, uh, the agent's utility depends not only on their own action, but also on the action of the other agents. So we all know about this, and we've all seen game matrices, I hope. Famous, most famous example, probably, of this kind of interaction is a prisoner's dilemma. Two agents committed a crime. The court doesn't have enough evidence to convict both of them, but tries to get them to uh, confess in order to uh, throw the other one into jail for a longer time. If one confesses, he goes free, the other gets four years. If both confess, they each get third, three years. They have no way of communicating or making binding agreements. This is a typical example of the prisoner's dilemma game matrix. We have the upper left-hand corner where they would both do better if they were both quiet. But in fact, zero is better than minus one, and minus three is better than minus four. And so this player one says, well, I'm better off confessing no matter what the other one does. And this player, player two, says exactly the same thing. Zero is better than minus one. Minus three is better than minus four. So I ought to confess no matter what the other one does. They both confess, and they end up in a Nash equilibrium in the lower right-hand corner, the only Nash equilibrium in this, in this game. Uh, and they end up both doing worse than if they were 
on the upper left-hand side. That's why it's so famous. It also is a good model for a lot of things in the real world, lots of real uh, world kinds of interactions. Um, but the basic idea here is that there's a rational outcome or a Nash equilibrium solution or the dominant solution in this case also, which says that they're going to play in a certain direction. And yet anybody who looks at this intuitively says, well, if they could talk to each other, they'd be up there. But maybe you need more than just them talking to each other. You actually need them being able to make an agreement with each other. Because if it's not a binding agreement, they'll still want to renege on the agreement and go back to the lower right-hand corner. Now, in real life games, when people play this, they actually cooperate quite a bit with each other. Um, people tend to be cooperative. They tend to play in certain so-called so irrational ways. But they actually do better by cooperating with each, with, each other, with each other, which is why it's not really fair to call it irrational. But the main point here is that they can't cooperate because they can't make a binding agreement. At least from the mathematical point of view, there's a good argument to be made for playing the dominant strategy, which in this case is playing confess. And playing the dominant strategy seems rational and leads you to a certain kind of outcome. But clearly, if they could make a binding agreement, being in this upper left-hand corner would be better for both of them. So um, the question in game theory arose, what if we look at these kinds of situations in a different model, not in a non-cooperative model like this, but in a cooperative model? And a cooperative model assumes the possibility of binding agreements. It assumes that agents can come together, self-interested agents, okay, the agents are still self-interested, like in non-cooperative games, but they see potential benefit from working with one another. And they can make binding agreements. So the idea is that groups of agents come together, and through the synergy of a group of them being together, get extra utility. There's some profit that they get just by forming a group. Now within this overall field, within game theory, there are two sub-areas. One is called transferable utility games, and the other is called non-transferable utility games. In transferable utility games, payoffs are given to the group and then divided among its members. This actually is going to be the main thing that we're talking about uh, today in the rest of, of my talk. Uh, transferable utility games, you hand a big profit over to the group, and then the group has to figure out within itself how to divide up the spoils. In a non-transferable utility game, it's still a cooperative game, but the group actions result in payoff to the individual group members, and they are no longer transferable. Whoever gets the profit gets the profit, at, like it were the payoff matrix. There's still a coalition. They still benefit from the coalition, but the payoffs go to the individual members. Um, there are a lot of practical applications for coalitions of machines, and this is why it's interesting for the field of multi-agent systems within artificial intelligence. The idea is to use these techniques for rational, intelligent, formal interaction in order to do things like load balancing. Electricity grids I put up there not by chance, but because actually this coalitional game theory is being used in real world electric grids. Um, you can imagine it as being particularly suitable if you have different electricity providers who are basically playing a game with each other and they're trying to interact in ways that are beneficial for everybody and sometimes they will form coalitions and benefit from the coalitions they formed. Obviously cloud computing systems, communication networks, any kind of load balancing really. Uh, ad hoc team formation like rescue and response teams where agents or robots that get to a site can work together or can choose to work together for their mutual benefit. Groups of online buyers represented by software agents. Suddenly these agents realize that if they all come together and they go to Amazon as a group of a thousand and buy you know, the television set, they can get a discount, right? Which they can then share the, the savings among the different group, among the group. Um, sensor networks, routing, all sorts of things. The questions that mainly come up are how to divide the benefits of cooperation in a fair and stable manner. Those are not synonyms. Fair is one thing, stable is another. Uh, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more as I go on. Um, so the basic idea is that the coalition comes together and forms teams, chooses an action. In the NTU games, that results in each player's payoff. And in transferable utility games, the, the, the actions of all the different coalitions affect the payoff, but the coalition gets some lump sum of money and then divides it up among the different players. So here's an example of a non-transferable utility game, uh, which would be the writing paper game. And the writing paper game involves um, researchers from different universities, including uh, Professor Alman from our university, and uh, this is Nash uh, for the Nash Equilibrium, and this is Shapley, who we'll get to later on today. Uh, and other players come together, they decide to form up in groups and write papers, and then they get a payoff from their university in terms of promotion or 
a bonus. Obviously, they're not talking about Israeli universities here. Uh, teaching load reduction. Uh, but something will happen which will be good for the individual players, but they're not, they can't transfer the utility between themselves. These two people wrote a paper together. Okay, each one benefited. That's a non-transferable utility game. A transferable utility game would be something like the Happy Farmer game. The Happy Farmer game has N farmers that want to cooperate to grow fruit, and they can decide whether to grow apples or oranges. There's a certain, certain convex function describing um, how much they can grow. Um, depending on the, the size of the group, and then they can sell it in the market, and there's going to be a maximal price, which they're going to get for what they're, from what they're, they've created. And then, if you look at this as a transferable utility game, you find that this group benefits a certain amount, but the benefit that they get depends on the other coalition. Right? So the two of them playing together, they might both choose apples. Right? And then your profit is going to be less than if the other side chooses oranges. Right? So the benefit of each coalition, seen as a group player, depends on the other one, just like in, in non-cooperative games, but the money that is profited by the group will be handed to the group and then they can split it up among themselves the way that they want. So it's a transferable utility game. Another example of a transferable utility game, a different one, but uh, interestingly related, is the uh, ice cream game. We have N children. They each have some amount of money. The I children has B sub I dollars and uh, they don't care a bit about money. Uh, what do children care about money? They care about ice cream, right? So what they want to do is they want to get rid of the money. They have absolutely no reason to hold on to the money. They want to get rid of the money and buy as much ice cream as they can. And the tubs of ice cream cost $7, $9, and $11 for Ben and Jerry's ice cream in various sizes. And what the children want to do is band together in order to buy as much ice cream as they can. Now, this is a step function, right? So a single child by himself might not be able to buy any ice cream whatsoever. Two children, depending on how much money they have, might be able to buy one tub. Three children together might be able to buy a different tub. Perhaps two other children, instead of the first two, would be able to buy a different tub and so on, right? So once they buy the ice cream, they can divide the ice cream among themselves, so it's a transferable utility game, okay? Good. Um, now there's two uh, subgroups within this. One is called a characteristic function game, and the other is a partition function game. Uh, partition function game is where the payoff of in, a, in a transferable utility game the payoff obtained by the coalition depends on the actions of the other coalitions. Um, and then there's a subcategory of that called characteristic function games. And most people, uh, in my experience, much of the literature is talking about characteristic function games, where there is a function that tells you how much a coalition will get without regard to the other coalitions. Okay? So in this case, with the ice cream, for example, this is a typical characteristic function game because there is no other coalition, right? And, and there's unlimited amounts of Ben and Jerry's. So it really doesn't matter what the other players do. What matters is what your coalition ends up doing. That's a simpler form because all you need to do is give me a function that tells me the profit for every sub-coalition. There are three children. Tell me the profit for each child individually, for each group of two, and for the group of three as a whole. Okay, so that's a characteristic function game. The, the happy farmers game is a um, partition function game because it depends on what the other farmers do in the other coalition. So in the big picture, we have something that looks like this. You can also actually uh, express um, um, that, that, uh, that any transferable utility game as a non-transferable utility game. I'm going to go into the details of how to do that. But basically, NTUs are a wider category, a broader category of games then transferable utility games, a subcase, and then characteristic function games are the most restricted subcase within uh, transferable utility games. And, and that's the one that actually many, many people look at, these characteristic function games. Um, so, right. Let's look how we, we look at uh, the, the formalization of this. So a transferable utility game is a pair. One is the agents, like we had in the non-cooperative game theory, set of agents. And we have this new thing called a characteristic function, which group takes any subset of agents and gives you back a number. The amount that the members of that coalition, that group together, can earn. Uh, and it's usually assumed to be normalized so that the empty set will get zero. Uh, it's non-negative for any coalition, and it's monotone. So when you get larger and larger coalitions, um, they tend to get more and more uh, profit. Um, the grand coalition is the entire group of agents, and that's often the most interesting uh, group that's being looked at in the, in the theoretical analysis. So let's look at the ice cream game and the characteristic function. We have Charlie Brown, Marcy, and Peppermint Patty. 
each with a certain amount of money in their pocket. Charlie Brown has six, Marcy has four, Peppermint Patty has three dollars, and then they've got these tubs of ice cream that they're really interested in buying for seven dollars, nine dollars, and eleven dollars. And then we say, well, what is the characteristic function given this game? Well, all of the, the empty set, of course, and each of the children by themselves can't buy any ice cream because the minimal cost of ice cream is seven dollars. Nobody's got seven dollars by themselves, so it's zero across the board for a single agent. When you have groups of agents, two agents together, it depends on which two you put together. So our Charlie Brown and Marcy together have $10, and they can buy the $759 um, tub. Same thing with Charlie and Patty, Pepper and Patty, but Marcy and Patty together have $7, and they can't afford this one. They can only afford this low one. So their value of that coalition is $500, and the value of the coalition, of the grand coalition, all of them together, is a thousand, which is to say they can, they can buy the, the biggest tub of ice cream. So an outcome in this transferable utility game is two things. First of all, it's a coalition structure, which is a partition of the agents into separate coalitions, how they're going to group together in order to act together, and then some payoff vector, which distributes the value of each coalition in the coalition structure. Okay, so what it's going to do then is give out some kind of money to each of these groups. That's the, the outcome of the transfer of utility game. Now notice that the, the outcome presupposes the transfer of utility has already happened. It's handing money to the different players, right? And the players, that's what the outcome is. They're gonna get a certain amount from having worked together. Okay, so it's not just saying I'll, lump, I'll give the entire red coalition a total amount, let them divide it up. The outcome actually says how much one is gonna get, how much two is gonna get, and how much three is gonna get. So here's an example. Um, let's say we have that uh, the value of one, two, and three together is equal to nine. The value of four and five together is four. Then we have an outcome here where we split up into these two separate groups and we've divided up the uh, payoff so that um, we give three each to one, two, and three and we give three to number four and one to number five. Okay, so that's an outcome. The other one is not an outcome because you can't have transfers between the coalitions. Here we give two, three, and two to the red players, but they haven't used up all of their nine value, and, and it's as if they were transferring part of their value to the other coalition, but they can't do that. That's not allowed. Um, this, this outcome is called an imputation if it satisfies individual rationality such that every single agent by themselves does better with the outcome than they would do if they were off by themselves. Okay? So in that sense, it's stable. They don't want to leave the coalition. It's kind of like a simple Nash equilibrium where they want to stay inside. They don't want to go outside. Okay, a super additive game is a game which when you have two groups come together, two disjoint coalitions come together, you get a value greater than the, separate, the value of the separate coalitions individually. Okay, this is kind of an interesting game for us. It means that there's synergy. It means that when the agents come together, they're getting something better than they got when they were separated. So an example of that would be a value function which takes the number of agents that are included in the coalition and squares it, and that's a value function. So if there's one agent, the value is one. If there's two agents inside, the value is four. If there's you know, five agents inside, the value is gonna be 25. And that happened, ends up being a super additive function because you can show that the value for this uh, union of these two disjoint coalitions, C and D, is equal to the square of the sum of the players inside of each of, one, each of them, which is greater than or equal to the sum of the squares, um, and therefore uh, the value of the union is gonna be greater than the value of the two separately. So just by that definition of the value function, we have a super additive uh, situation, interaction. Um, because in a super additive game, you often have the situation where you have the grand coalition form because that's going to be, uh, make the most sense from the point of view of the utility. They will never do worse uh, than if they uh, come together. Right? They can never do better than if they all come together. Right? They can only do worse. So all the agents will group together and have the grand coalition. Um, okay, I actually want to skip that. All right, so let's talk a little bit about solution concepts. So the game theoreticians and the computer scientists who followed them started to ask questions about um, the, the way that we can characterize these interactions, these coalitional interactions. So to throw ourselves back for a moment, remember that we talked about a solution concept like dominance in non-cooperative games. So a dominant solution means 
that an agent can play a certain move which is better for him in every situation, no matter what the other player does. So in the prisoner's dilemma, um, uh, confessing turned out to be the dominant player, right? The dominant thing to do because it was better no matter what the other player did. We would like similar mathematical characterizations of these coalitional interactions that we can talk about things like stability uh, and fairness uh, within these coalitions. So there's a large number of them, and I'm not going to talk about, about most of them. I will talk just about the core, uh, which is the most common, one of the most popular and, and interesting way of looking at the stability of these coalitions. So we looked at the same situation with Charlie Brown and his friends, and we said that we have a value function, V, that tells us what every coalition and subcoalition gets in terms of the game. It is a super additive game. How should the players share the ice cream? So you can't share the ice cream in a way that encourages some of the players to break away from the coalition. This is a, a basic idea inside of cooperative game theory. You want this outcome to be, to be stable because you don't want any of the players to be disgruntled and to leave the coalition for greener pastures somewhere else. So if, like for example, they share the big tub of ice cream, right, which is 750, okay, we have where the value of all three together in this case, in this particular case is 750. So they decide to share it 200, 200, and 350, and Charlie and Marcy look at each other and they say, together we got 400, but if we break away, just the two of us, we can get 500. Then we can give each of us 250. Therefore, we don't like this outcome. This outcome is not stable, right? And therefore, 200, 200, and 350, from the game theoretic point of view, isn't a good way to divide the spoils among the players in the coalition. So stability is defined as a strong situation, stronger than a simple Nash equilibrium, where, in fact, no subcoalition has an incentive to break away. Not the single agents and not any grouping of the agents has an incentive to try to break away. Okay, there's some examples here, but let's go on. So what is the core of the ice cream game? Um, 250, 250, and 250 is in the core because it turns out that nobody can break away and get more than they got with this outcome. For example, Charlie and Marcy might say, oh, we break away, we're gonna get 500, and either we're going to both get 250 or one of us is going to get less than 250 if the other one gets more. Therefore, this is a stable outcome. It's in the core. Another one that's in the core is 750-00. Right? Why 750-00? Because Marcy and Patty together can get zero, and each of them individually can get zero. And therefore, although they have obviously been given the short end of the stick here, it's still in the core. It's still an outcome which is stable. They all band together, they buy the ice cream, and Charlie Brown keeps all of it. Right? So from the mathematical point of view, we have satisfied the requirements, but something still seems wrong. Right? It still seems like Charlie Brown oughtn't to be able to keep all of the ice cream, even though he is a little bit more powerful than the others, but just because of the, the value function and what, who can break away. So stable, yes, fair. No, or perhaps no. Um, there are also games with an empty core. Uh, we don't have time to talk about it, but uh, the core is really a nice solution, but there are, in fact, examples where there is no core, which is to say no outcome provides a stable solution. And there's an example of it here. Because there are some games where the core is empty, a new idea came forward called the Epsilon core which says that we're not going to uh, require absolute stability. We're going to require a certain degree of stability. And we're going to say that the agent won't defect and leave the coalition as long as he can't get um, more than epsilon, what he's getting in the current outcome. Now, he has to do better than epsilon right? when he goes over to the, defective, the defecting coalition. Uh, and there's an example here as well. So there may be situations where there, the core is empty. There's absolutely no way to divide up the outcome that makes, makes sure that everybody stays together. But if you put in this epsilon uh, consideration, then all the agents will stay together. So this is a particular example of a one-third core 
which is non-empty for a particular game. All right. Um, another notion of stability, which was uh, put forward actually by a PhD student of mine uh, here at Hebrew University, is something called the cost of stability. Uh, happy to say that it's caught on quite a bit with uh, computer scientists who are looking at these kinds of questions. And the question that was asked there is, let's say we have a game with an empty core. Okay, epsilon core is one way of solving the problem. Another way of solving the problem is to consider the fact that there might be an external player like a government who is willing to put in value into the coalition in order to stabilize it. So maybe there are a group of hospitals that are trying to buy expensive equipment and there is no way that they can group together in order to save money on the expensive equipment. There's no core. There's no way to, to come together, have a certain profit from the banding together, and then buy the big uh, CAT scan machine um, and use it between them in a way that makes it clear that they shouldn't defect and buy it on their own. So the government steps in and says, if we put in a million dollars, then we can stabilize the game and we subsidize it but now all the hospitals will in fact be motivated to come together and buy a single cat machine rather than buying three separate cat machines because with the million dollars that I pump into it, the government pumps into it, it is now stable. So the cost of stability is the minimum amount of subsidy, of external subsidy, that will stabilize the coalitional gain. Okay, and this was a question, again, this was not something that arose in the game theory literature, but it was something that arose in the computer science literature and the artificial intelligence literature in order to look at coalitional games and look at another problem, uh, another way of stabilizing them. Um, other solution concepts which I will not talk about, there's the least core, the nucleolus, the bargaining set, the kernel, and then there are some things which are fairness considerations, the Shapley value and the Banzoff index, which I do want to talk about briefly. These were all talking about stability, but remember Charlie Brown, can have a stable outcome, which is in the core, where he gets all of the ice cream and his two friends get nothing, and that is stable, but it's not fair. So along came two people, uh, one is Lloyd Shapley, the other is uh, Banzoff, and they said, you know what, we have another way of characterizing payoffs, not just stability, but also fairness. So this is an example of a game which is unfair, right? The game involves this, these N agents, two agents in this case, and a a value function, a characteristic function, and it gives the empty set zero, of course. It gives one by himself or two by himself five points, and when they band together, they get 20 points. So in the core is 15-5 because neither one can do better by breaking away, right? The one that wants to break away here, five will get five anyway, so he doesn't break away, and of course, 15 doesn't break away, he's happy. So 15.5 is in the core, 14.6 is in the core, 13.7 is in the core, all these various things are in the core. Um, but there's something wrong here because players one and player, player one and player two are symmetric. They bring exactly the same thing to the game as opposed to the Charlie Brown case. He had a little bit more money in his pocket, but here they don't even have more money in their pocket. Right? By themselves, they could get five, they come together. Why should they be treated asymmetrically in the solution concept? But the core doesn't care. The course says nothing about symmetry. So along came people like Shapley and said, what about marginal contribution? A fair payment scheme ought to reward each agent according to the contribution that it makes to the coalition. So you might say, okay, what we'll do is we'll take an ordering and we'll look at what one agent gets by himself and then how much the next agent adds. So we take agent one and he gets five points. Agent two comes along and now we have 20. So the marginal contribution of agent two was 15, right? So he had a very high marginal contribution. And then player one goes, wait, wait, let's do it in the other order. Player two is by himself, he gets five, and I'll come along and I'll get the marginal contribution of 15. And Shapley goes, right, what we need to do is in fact try to look at all possible orderings, right? Remove the dependence on ordering by looking at permutations. We'll look at all the different possible orderings. This is pretty simple if we only have two agents. So we look at all the different possible orderings. What's the average marginal contribution? 10, right? Sometimes it's five and sometimes it's 15, depending on your order. So the average marginal contribution for both is 10. And what do you know? 10 plus 10 adds up to 20. And we've efficiently used up all of the value that the coalition got by working together. And what Shapley said was, in fact, that's not by chance. What we have here is if we look at the mathematical characterization of doing this for all permutations, 
We'll look at every single possible permutation of subcoalitions. We will add in agent I, right, in each possible location, at each possible ordering, and then we will give them a weighted average, right, of their, of their, um, of their pay, of the marginal contribution that they made, and then they will get whatever they marginally contributed on average throughout all the different possible permutations. So in the previous slide, the Shapley value would in fact be 10 for the both agents, and it's symmetric, and it's exactly what we would expect. Um, so another way of interpreting it would be probabilistically, if you choose a permutation of players uniformly random among all the possible permutations, what is the expected marginal contribution of player I? And that's going to be his Shapley value. So what was nice about this when Shapley came up with it was that it was an axiomatic characterization that satisfies four big properties. One is efficiency, which means it uses up all of the value of the coalition. Every single dollar that the coalition got is split up among the players using this technique. So not by chance that one got 10 and the other got 10, and that was the full value of 20, right? Shapley value will, in fact, give everybody a portion such that the sum adds up to the total. Dummy, if I is a dummy and has no marginal contribution, he will, in fact, get zero. If two agents are symmetric, they'll get the same, and it also has a nice additivity property of separate games that are added together. The, va the Shapley value of the added together game will be the sum of the Shapley values of the individual games. But more interestingly, Shapley value is the only thing that actually has all of those properties. So like with Nash and the Nash bargaining solution, other things in game theory, Shapley was able to point at this and say, here is a solution which not only does it have all sorts of nice intuitive properties, but mathematically, it's the only solution that has these four very reasonable properties that probably all of you should like. The Banzoff index is another version of this, and instead of looking at all permutations, it looks <coughs> at all subcoalitions. Not important for the moment, but uh, it's another technique for trying to get fairness. The main thing that it fails on is efficiency. Um, it still keeps symmetry and dummy and, and, some, and the other property of, of additivity, but it fails on efficiency, which means it will not necessarily use up all of the value of the coalition. Uh, some examples, let's forget about that. Um, so this was all an introduction, it was all tutorial, and I've basically used up my time telling you about coalitional game theory, which is fine, um, but I want you to take away from the last few minutes of the talk the idea of what we're looking at inside the field of multi-agent systems and computational social choice and related fields inside of artificial intelligence. There are all of these different concepts, like with the Nash equilibrium, talk about the mathematical properties that these games might have, but doesn't talk about the computational burden of trying to compute them efficiently. And the way in which these games are represented has a very, very strong connection with the efficiency of computation of these various games. Um, depending on the way in which the games are represented, Computing things like the core or the cost of stability can be polynomial time. It can be trivial to calculate things like what is the minimum subsidy in order to stabilize the coalition? Right? We have a, 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 a network routing problem and we're looking at this network of routers and they're passing information back and forth and groups of routers can come together in order to form connected paths through the graph and we'd like to divide up the benefit among these routers. How long will it take us to figure it out? How long will the core take us to figure out the core? How long will it take us to either figure out the Shapley value or more likely approximate the Shapley value? In certain kinds of games, depending on the, the representation, these things can be polynomial time. Depending on the representation, they can be exponential and, and, and hard to compute. Okay, so a lot of the work that's gone on in this area over the last five, six years has been in various kinds of games and various representations that allow us to compute things efficiently. Um, um, okay, so let me, let me look at this quickly. The first problem here is the idea of the, of the characteristic function. Um, one way of dealing with it is not dealing with it. It's simply from a mathematical point of view saying it's an oracle representation. We don't care how it's represented, but we're going to assume that we can get the value out in polynomial time. And now we're going to present you with nice algorithms that assume this black box which can be efficiently queried. So for example, if you had all the agents uh, listed in all the subcategories, you made a big table and you listed the value function, the characteristic function next to each possible coalition, then all you have to do is access the table and pull out the, the value. But of course, as you get more and more agents, you're going to have an exponentially growing number of subcoalitions. So the size of the table is growing exponentially, 
even though the number of agents is growing linearly. And the Oracle representation says, well, we'll just ignore that for the time being. Okay? But there are algorithms that depend on the Oracle representation and concentrate on the polynomial aspect of the, of the algorithm outside of the value function itself. The other two strategies are slightly more interesting and have involved a lot of work inside of artificial intelligence um, and the game theory oriented parts of it. One is restricted classes where usually you consider games on combinatorial structures and you can then pull out the value function in an efficient way, uh, but not all games can be represented that way. So what you've gotten is a restricted class of games that can be represented in an efficient manner. The other possibility is to give up on worst case succinctness and have a representation language that is often succinct, but sometimes it will grow exponentially in size and you are willing to allow that so that you will have complete coverage of all possible games. So these are two different uh, ways of dealing with it. I'm not going to talk about this. I'm not going to talk about that. So many interesting things here. Uh, but I do want to show you an example. Uh, OK, so this is a network flow game. I just add one example, quick example. A network flow game and variations on the network flow game have been presented as coalitional games, but they're specific kinds of coalitional games. You're trying to get a flow through the network from a unique source node to a unique target node. And they have to travel over these arcs. And the arcs themselves are the agent. So we're going to have a coalition that forms, let's say, of the agent SA and the agent AT. And now they're going to have a certain capacity of what they can pass through the network. And the capacity that they can pass through the network is their characteristic function. So in this case, SA and AT together have a capacity of four. And that's the value of the coalition that includes SA and AT. SA, AT, and ST together have a capacity of seven, because we can pass four up here, and we can pass three over there. So it's common to a structure where we have a quick way of getting out the value of the coalition. And now you start asking questions like, how complicated is it to calculate the core, to calculate the Shapley value, to cap calculate the epsilon core, the, um, the um, cost of stability, for games that are played out over this kind of a structure. Another example, which I really won't get to talk about, is what's called the weakest link games, and it represents work that we've just been doing in, the, in recent months, which takes a situation like this and looks not at the um, flow that can get through the network, but looks at the weakest link along a path. Right? So what you're looking at is the weakest link along this path and the weakest link along this path and then maximal between the two of those. So in this case, the value of the, of the coalition that includes the SA, AT, and ST would be four. Because let's say you wanted to take a truck and you wanted to know what's the heaviest truck that I can get from S to T. The heaviest truck that I can get is four because it'll travel up here successfully and travel down there successfully. But you can't travel that truck of four across here and therefore the value of the coalition is what the weakest link uh, of the best path is, which in this case is four. Again, questions of computation, questions of figuring out uh, cost of stability, core, epsilon core, and so on, all related to these specialized forms of games. I have skipped through very, very much, but I'm at the end of my time, thank you very much. Yeah, it is. And I, in fact, the, the electrical grid example that I put up um, is a specific case that I know about where I think it was in Spain, uh, if my memory serves, where they were actually using these techniques in order to design uh, load balancing in electrical grids. Um, so it is actually being used in certain contexts. Right. Yeah. Uh, the way you describe it, you get to the most cases uh, is bad No, I, no, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to give that, that, uh, that impression. Okay, so let me try to get rid of that impression in my final minute. Um, most of the interesting cases are not NP hard, but the games, the restricted games, which are interesting real world examples, and proving that those restricted games are not NP hard is in fact a lot of the research that's going on. 
So for example, the network flow game, the threshold network flow game, the variation on that, the weakest link cooperative games, um, weighted voting games, which is another whole category of cooperative games where if you just have a quota together, then you get one. You get a value of one, and otherwise you get a value of zero, like in a Knesset, like in a parliament, where you get together a quota of people, and then they get value one. They pass the law. If they're not up to that quota, they get zero. So those are interesting games, and they're deal, you can, they can be dealt with polynomially. Okay, and there are many, many such interesting kinds of games. There are skill set games, cooperative skill set games, where each player has a resource. They have to bring the resources together in order to accomplish some task. And those are also uh, uh, you, yeah, polynomial. Yeah. In your slide, you see the techniques to uh, a closed auction scenario. A closed auction scenario? Yeah. Well, you're the only well, the only agent is one agent that doesn't know is not aware about other agents. So yeah, I'm not. I just want to understand the model. So the agent makes a bid. Yeah. Unaware of the other agents. I don't, it's not a coalitional game. I would look at it from the point of view of, of other kinds of strategy, auction strategies. Uh, if there's a dominant, depending on the nature of the auction, there might be a dominant voting strategy. Um, for example, in an English auction where the prices rise, there's a dominant voting strategy. You keep going up until you get to your value and then you drop out, or you keep going up one higher than the previous person and then. If you win, you win. If you don't, you drop out. What about second prize auctions? Where you okay, so second prize auctions are a classic case where you're incentivized to tell the truth. So not even knowing what everybody else has done, you can prove to me mathematically that the best thing to do is to report my true value in a second prize auction, in a simple second prize auction. So there's other kinds of mathematical analysis, just not coalitional game theory. Yeah. 